So without much more ado, I'm going to hand over to Ifan to take us forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is this? It is. Thank you. Um, we have about 40 minutes. Uh, so what I had in mind was maybe 30 minutes, something like that, of a kind of a steered discussion, and then open the floor to some questions afterwards. So um, as, as we're discussing, if you can um, put your minds to what kind of questions we might have in an open session towards the end. And I'm also just going to pass the microphone around quickly so that everybody can uh, introduce themselves very briefly, if you may. Um, and I'll try and do that myself. So my name is Ivan Evans. I'm the head of healthcare technology and innovation for the Welsh government, where I work in the Department for Health with the NHS uh, industry and universities. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Nigel Holden. I'm uh, BCS Health Wales Secretary. I'm also a senior lecturer at Glyndor University and I'm very much in interested in the smart home and robotics in health. Hi, my name is Andrew Griffiths. I'm the director of an organisation called the NHS Wales Informatics Service and also the chief information officer for, for Wales. Hello, I'm Dr Kerry Bailey. I'm a GP and a consultant in public health and I also work with WePredict and SME in Swansea doing predictive analytics. Hi everyone, I'm Warren, I'm CEO and founder of Nudged and we produce a set of health analytics for workforces as well as having a tailored health advice system that adapts to individual users and we're a venture funded startup with nice sound effects in the background from God. It's <laughs> good that beard really is working for you. Angelic. Um, so if you, if you hold on to that mic, um, I've got about half a dozen questions um, and um, I'll ask you just to jump in. Um, first one, and if nobody does, then I'll make eye contact, and, uh, and the loser gets to go first. Uh, so so the, the first question, th there is a sort of a, an intro to this that we're going to talk about how digital and technology is enabling um, all sorts of changes in healthcare, um, but I'm going to kick it off with a question of what is it that we need from digital? That's a big question. Well, it, it was informed by a discussion that was in a session next door about um, in technology and digital, um, should innovation be driven by push or by pull? Um, and the whole room was, well, it should be pull. So if it's pull, what is it that's pulling technology and digital change in healthcare? I, th I think there's, a, there's some interesting things about healthcare that are different to other sections of digital. So um, there is a difference between a user's want and a user's need. So you might want to lose weight, you might need to change your diet to lose weight. And there's a real clear divide, and so I've worked in a couple of different digital tech companies and with big people like Google and Virgin and, you know, large to small, and it's very rare that you have that clearer divide for users between the things that they desire to happen and the things that they actually need. And even though the things they need are good for them, there'll be a resistance to that thing because, you know, you're, you're attempting to change their life. And I think it's important that we keep a focus on Digital isn't a magic button that's going to come in and solve these problems for us, and we should keep a very user-centric focus on anything we develop. And digital is good at a couple of different things, but it's not good at everything, and it shouldn't replace every element of healthcare. So I, I, that's my experience from, from, from being in a tech startup, is recognizing the divide between want and need, trying to bridge it using smart pieces of technology, but only for relatively limited use cases initially, I think. I suppose um, very much where, where my research lies, it builds upon that in, in many ways. Uh, for me, the, the pull factor is uh, an, an aging population. If you think in a few years' time, there is going to be more people over the age of 60 than there is under the age of 60. So for caring for those people is going to become exceptionally difficult as time goes on. So for me, the idea of using smart tech to help maintain people's independence in their homes whether that be through robotics or sensors, to ensure that they're healthy, that they're maintaining things they should do, that they're taking their pills. All that type of thing kind of feeds into the big data stuff as well. That, I think, for me, is the pull. And I think if we can help solve that, we're going to help solve a lot of the blockages that we can see currently in the NHS. Because if we can get people home faster, so they're being monitored safely, securely, that means A&E can then admit to the wards faster, which means the ambulances can then get people into A&E faster. So hopefully there's a cycle there. And so that sort of my pull is certainly, you know, an aging population. My perspective would be on this. What do we need within digital is to retain the humanity of it. We heard last year um, 
somebody here who was talking about a lot about robotics, um, but almost that the, uh, the digital interface could replace a human. Now, that may be true in some cases, but of course we know that in rural areas it is that human connection that perhaps the, well, anybody, vulnerable, elderly, um, benefits from. So as we develop new digital innovations, we must go back to some of our more old-fashioned, if you like, evaluations. And I saw this around the um, uh, telehealth when we actually did have a brilliant RCT, and yet there were still people who were suggesting it be rolled out, um, not taking into account the fact that there were just as many people who didn't benefit it, um, from it as those who did. So we need to reflect on what are the true benefits of this. It's, it's very attractive. You know, you know, I wear a fitness monitor, even though I know that there is no evidence that it is going to increase my activity. Um, and so when people are saying, oh, if we get this data, then it's going to make a lot of difference, um, we, we just have to remember that the pull can't just be, it seems like a really good idea. It has to be the evidence and the benefits to individuals. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, th I think before... Um, before we talk a lot about innovation, I think there's some basic things that we've got to do as, as part of the NHS. Um, and some of that relates to just knowing who the people are, and why they're coming in for treatment, and being able to follow them through that whole um, care pathway. So at the moment, we, we sometimes struggle with some of that basic infrastructure. So I guess most people will be familiar with the, with the medical record in, in secondary care. And part of what we've really got to do is actually eliminate that medical record in its paper form uh, and get to a position where we can actually move that record that information electronically and move it around with the patient. And I think uh, we're getting in place lots of the infrastructure to enable us to do that. There's some big initiatives going on currently uh, to move us to that position. And I think one of the key breakthroughs will be that, having that single uh, electronic record for a patient in Wales. And, and when we get that, that will enable us to do, I think, a lot of the other things uh, that we really want to do. And I think in answer to your question, I think, I think there's got to be pull and push. Um, and I think we've got, we've got to get a standardised infrastructure, which we're then able to innovate on and allow people to use the data in different ways and find new ways of delivering care. I think if you look at the NHS, we know that as a system, it is, it is um, not the most efficient system. And, you know, just to take one area of that, outpatients is absolutely desperately in need of modernisation. And lots of that modernisation and things that we could do differently come as a result of being able to apply technology to that, particularly the technology that says, here's your medical record, you've now appeared with that information rather than being sent around the system uh, to either be retested or to, to find that information. I could go on, but I'll stop at that point. Uh, I'm just going to jump in and say something, maybe from a government perspective, that there are a number of different we's in that answer. Some of it was about patients, some of it was about the NHS, um, some of it was about the clinicians that are involved in there, um, and you know, government tries to hold all of that in the round and in the balance, and uh, the Minister has set out a prudent healthcare agenda. It, it's not a million miles from international approaches to healthcare value that traditionally focus on three things. Uh, patient experience, you know, clearly digital can bring experience close to uh, patients and empower patients. Um, clinical uh, healthcare and clinical outcomes, assistive decision technology, better information at the point of decision making, earlier prognostics and, and diagnostics, very, very important in that space. Um, and, and the third of those is, is resource efficiency or cost savings efficiencies, because we have a system which is very, very expensive, not as expensive as the US system, um, but still a very, very expensive uh, system. And for it to be sustainable, we have to find cheaper ways of delivering the same quality of care. Um, so we see there's a lot of there's a lot of need, and technology is often presented as as the solution for that. Um, so I guess the next question I've got, and you don't all have to answer, by the way. So if anybody thinks it's just too difficult a question, you can just duck out. Um, if if we need these things, and we've known for some time that we've needed technology driven and digital and data enabled changed, who, who's going to drive this, and and why are they going to do it, and what is the incentive? for them to do it. And there are a number of stakeholders, and I'm just going to run through some, but feel free to add more. Um, the, the academic and research partners, um, businesses, there's an enormous market here, um, clinicians and the clinical system, which would be the NHS, and patients and the public themselves, who, who you know, are very keen on taking charge of their own health, certainly as far as downloading apps. Um, so, so who's going to drive this? You know, who's going to speed it up and make, make it happen at pace? 
Uh, you made eye contact, and <laughs> it was a mistake. <laughs> I've got the mic. Um, I, well, I, I think all of those people can drive it. Um, I think this particular people who've got responsibility, so I think the NHS has a responsibility to do this and should therefore be the prime driver of it. Um, I think there's lots of reasons within healthcare that we know that we need to do to do some of these things and that goes down to all of the, the, the sort of issues that you've already alluded to, the cost of healthcare, uh, the rising demand for healthcare, uh, the increasing specialisation within healthcare, so, so now it's not uh, good enough uh, to turn up at your local hospital to be treated, you will very often need to go to another hospital because of the specialisation that occurs. And, and so, therefore, we are seeing healthcare being more in centres of excellence, uh, which means that your, the information about you will, might be recorded in disparate settings, but then pulled, to, pulled together in one setting. So, I think there are lots of drivers within the health service to get to this point of having a single electronic record about, about the patient. I think patients are demanding it. Um, I think the attitude towards um, patient information and the clinical note has changed dramatically over the years. Um, certainly, probably not that long ago, uh, when, um, I don't speak on behalf of all clinicians, but lots of clinicians would have believed the record was their record about the patient, and that, that has clearly shifted um, culturally, uh, I, at least I think so, um, and we're going to see greater demands for that information. I also think, sorry I'm going on, um, I also think there's a, there's a big drive for where we're getting all this data from. Um, and so there's clearly data being recorded in the health service, but there is also data being collected by patients. Your, I, you know, your living proof of that, your Fitbit is, is providing somebody with lots of information at the moment. And the question is, can we bring that together? I'm not suggesting your Fitbit, but um, at a, a particular time to give more diagnostic information. There's also genetic information. So we've got an explosion of information happening and we've got to find ways of filtering our way and navigating through that. Of course, it should be all those groups, and that's the way that cultural change will happen. Um, we were at Rock Health last year in San Francisco, and the young entre entrepreneurs in San Francisco who get massively funded from the uh, tech uh, people who are already in San Francisco. And one of my concerns there was that maybe some of the uh, innovation and development was being driven rather idealistically, rather than going back to those people who are really at need. And we've said, oh, okay, maybe it's the changing demographics and the elderly, but actually, it's a lot of attendances, a lot of illness is now happening in the slightly younger group who have certain lifestyle factors. Um, and of course, it's the same vulnerable people who maybe aren't going to be the ones accessing technology in the same way. And so there's a, there can be a lot of drivers from um, very powerful people who have uh, experience of life around a certain type of life who may drive certain types of development and innovation. And I don't think this is the case in Wales, perhaps, but we have to keep remembering that deprivation um, graph and that we really do need to keep remembering the most vulnerable and who are most at need and what their needs will be. I think from, a, from an external kind of, uh, we, we're talking to Public Health Wales and the NHS on lots of different levels, and I think one of the challenges for change within NHS is, is the move towards a more agile infrastructure. And one of the scary things about technology, and particularly in working with private sector businesses like myself, is um, there's, uh, there's, there's a question of ethics, which is really core. Like, so do we, do we want to privatise any element of our, of our national health service? And we have to be very careful about what we do. But also there has to be an element of trust because the ability of a small business like mine to be agile, to think uh, quickly and apply that learning, but it doesn't necessarily conform with the kind of clinical rigor that a lot of the NHS is really used to. So when we go in to talk to the directors of public health, what we are very clear about is that we collect really broad, dirty data. Like, so Nudged is not here to collect the same type of clinical data that you're used to working with, but we feel like the kind of data we collect is useful in a different way and it allows development of services in a much faster and more agile manner. And we understand that it's gonna take five, 10 years for the NHS to adopt a, a, a different set of processes and it's a huge organization. It's, it's I think it's top five employer, single employer in the world. It's, it's incredible as, as an infrastructure and we have to be patient with the NHS as it adopts new processes. So I think, it's wrong to rush in. 
it's wrong to be set by a political agenda. It's very proper that we set down what the ethics of digital in our healthcare care system is, but it's also important that we recognize the value of innovation, specifically first user-orientated and demand-led, patient-driven co-creation, I think is what is called within the NHS um, uh, models, and that's kind of part of the agenda that, that we take um, to, 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 to the people we talk to, and hopefully we can have a hybrid model that works best for everyone. Well, that, that actually quite neatly comes into what I've got on my next list of questions, um, which is that um, if we're talking about lots of different um, stakeholders, lots of different groups driving change, some of it led by uh, patient demand, public expectation, some of it led by clinician adoption, um, one of the striking things is that the people who are working in the NHS actually use all sorts of whizzy technology in their daily lives, in their personal lives. They've all got iPhones, they've got iPads, they've got various other things. Uh, there's, there's a quote from Jack Welsh, the chief exec of um, GE, that says that if the world outside is changing faster than uh, your organization is changing inside, then you'll go out of business. Um, that doesn't actually apply to the NHS in the same way, you'll be relieved to hear. Um, but there is still a question about where is the, the, the platform or the junction for engaging all of these different people? Because things like the, uh, the uh, apps platform on iPhones or many, many other software things, moving now to a platform provision, basically all comers can come in and, and use standard tools. Um, so, uh, and and the, the, the phrases, you know, platforms, ecosystems for software development come up all the time. Uh, and, and that applies to information governance, it applies to the way that we structure and inter inter interchange data and uh, the way that systems interoperate. So, so wh where do you feel we are on that in, in Wales and, and how important is that as a way of enabling lots of different parties to be driving things along at the, at the pace which, which they might want to? I can see Warren smiling, but he's not allowed to go yet because I'm sure he knows what his, what his answer is already. Does anybody else want to go first? Not that Warren's done. <laughs> I'm happy to go first anyway. Um, yeah, it's. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with the premise of the question. I don't think. Um, I, yeah, no, I know, I know. I'm trying. I'm trying to be a bit slightly controversial. Um, I, th I think the the important thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, and I think it's really easy to get diverted into doing things that are really great things to do, um, but are window dressing when you haven't got windows, if I can put it that way. And I don't, no pun intended with windows there. Um, and so there's a little bit about what, what are we seeking to do in the NHS? I, I totally agree. I think the NHS is not as great as, at, as adopting new technologies we would like it to be for a whole host of reasons, some of which you've already identified. Um, I, I think there is a bit about what, does, what do we need as an NHS to, to improve patient care? And I won't go over the same things again, but I think it is about getting an electronic patient record that is accessible to clinicians wherever they're treating that patient. I think that's fundamentally important. Um, however, in doing that, I do, do think that we need to be preparing the ground um, and, and saying that there's a, a lot of that means that there's a standard infrastructure which does allow you to start innovating. Um, and so that does uh, bring about a platform where maybe we can interact with other, with other providers, with other people, um, and some of that I think will increasingly be, be uh, guided by patients who might make their own choices about how they see those two worlds coming together. So there's almost the sort of professional clinical world of data coming together with the Fitbit of the kind of data sources that people might choose themselves to bring together. So I think there's a whole world of possibilities opening up, but I think for, for me as a sort of NHS person, then the real important thing is getting the main things right. Um, and I think that's critically important. Uh, I was gonna say kind of sort of building on that if you like. I, I mean, I spent five years in the NHS. I'm not just an academic. Um, and one of the things I saw there was a lot of attempts at window dressing without the windows. The amount of money that got wasted because somebody thought, oh, we must jump up on this now, was horrendous. Uh, I mean, I'm going back to the 1990s when NHS Net was first starting. Um, people just were jumping on fads and just wasting massive amounts of money. I agree with Andrew, we've got to get the, the platform correct first. Um, when I first started the NHS, we first started talking about electronic patient records. I mean, that was 20 years ago. 
And thankfully now in Wales, we're just getting there to have this great one electronic record that can be accessed. Now, that I think is the platform we need to build on and we must be careful about how we start bouncing around dressing the windows. I just want to pick up on the one thing, which is IG, and I think if there was some common platform for that, then that would be really useful, because I think there's a lot of misinterpretation of um, legislation, and further than that, even when we completely follow the legislation, there's further reinterpretation based on politics or, or other things, and I, I think, yes, we're all aware there, there are potential dangers and risks, there's never going to be none, but actually the ethics, the benefits far outweigh that, but if there's absolute clarity about what can be linked, be it from another source or be it NHS or to what, then that would help, be it in sale or any other source, and who can also look at that, be it private, public, academic, <laughs> too, don't give me two microphones. Um, so I, I, I break it down because I come from kind of this startup tech culture into to three blocks, which is what our investors would check us for, and it's people process vision. So I would say if we're expecting the NHS to change, what we need to do is um, make people in the NHS more comfortable with digital, with data, with this kind of idea of technology. So we empower people within the, 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 who know the problem, who deal with patients, who are engaged with them. We empower them to, to, to the, we give them the resource to understand how they could solve those problems with technology. And the second step is you give them a process that allows them some kind of framework to iterate, to, to develop these things with limited risk. So you either limit the risk to patients, you limit the risk to them, you limit the costs, whatever that looks like. And for us in startups, that's called agile and it's called lean. But within the NHS, it, it may be a... Of, it could be called the same thing, it could be prudent healthcare, it could be a variation on whatever, and it's important to develop process centric and specific to the needs and requirements of that organization. Lean for me is not the same as it is for Uber or Facebook, it's a different thing. Um, and vision, somebody needs to set the vision, and, and, and that's the thing we're trying to say, is like, is, is, you're, you're dressing the window without the window, so what are we actually trying to achieve with our public health and digital technology. What is it that we want from this as a fundamental? And that does not mean that we want you to be able to tweet your records. That's not a thing that we want. Maybe we want efficient communication without, with, with lossless. We want high fidelity records that can be easily transferred in a safe, secure manner. But if that's the vision, then technology might always be the answer, or at least not existing technology. And by empowering the people at the bottom with those, that knowledge that uh, technology is a changing, moving beast, giving them a process that allows them to learn as they go and apply their knowledge and increase their knowledge, and towards that vision, you can always check on the way if that's where you want to be. And I, I, I'm a big advocate of you know, de-risking it and empowering people within organisations. I think I'm, I'm going to say something really nice now. I, th I think Andrew's undersold the magnitude of the achievement in Wales over the last um, few years in terms of um, a designed architecture for digital systems. Um, and sale is a part of that. Uh, the, the, the value not only of the data which is in sale, but the consenting model and the de-identification model around sale is, is huge and is recognized outside of Wales. Um, what perhaps we're guilty of is not being bold enough in telling everybody what a good product we have here um, and sometimes in being a little reluctant to open that up to external third parties even if only in a limited step and then opening it further and further. They are wonderful tools to work with as you saw from that presentation from We Predict just before this one. What you can do with sale, the power of sale is just magnificent. Um, and actually I think that our digital architecture is similar. There, there, there's so much that you can do with it. Um, and there are great, great opportunities there. We're, we're about halfway through, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to maybe push a little bit more on, on the ecosystem stuff. So we have a platform, um, and um, you know the platform is open in certain circumstances. Maybe the information governance model is a little bit onerous at the minute, but those are things we can work through. Um, where is the ecosystem in Wales? Who, who is our ecosystem for driving new development? Because we tend to move towards in-house or towards um, you know, sort of a, a specify and procure model. Um, do, do we have scope to open it up? And do we have the capacity in Wales to do that, or do we have to go wider? Any thoughts? Well, as a, someone attempting to sell to the NHS, it's in my interest to kind of 
to, to, to maybe to, to answer here. Um, I, uh, we won't sell to the NHS unless we're allowed to be agile because it kills my business. There's, 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 there's no point in me selling against a waterfall deliverable because it'll be wrong and we make a noose for ourselves. So it's part of the job of what we're doing with public health and with selling as a supplier to the NHS is trying to set up frameworks that allow purchasing to happen in small increments that maybe don't give us the windfall that we'd have from a commercial basis, but allow uh, de-risking of that process because what we really need to be able to do is to, uh, KPI, is only as relevant as you know as 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 the measure is to, to success. And if you set out to you know, you might target one KPI, but in three years' time it may be irrelevant. It may be the wrong KPI to measure. But then you're forced to deliver against it to prove that you've been successful at some level. And one of the things I've learned from the kind of startup that we run is that KPIs run in loops, and you need short-term measures, medium-term measures, long-term measures, and you you have to be quite quick at changing them at some points because you learn there's more efficient ways to measure longer term success. Um, and so I, I, I guess it's, uh, it's, I would see the role, our role as an external supplier in some ways is to, to, to come in and be educated and not be closed off to the idea of you know, setting targets, but also to say, look, we don't want to lose the bit that makes us different to you because the power of this partnership is to bring agility to a large hugely scaled, impressive, incredible organization that we have here in the UK. Nigel, do you want to say something about the informatics community in Wales? I think, I mean, like I say, some of uh, my experiences is now thankfully out of date. Um, but from even on the inside, I, I, I mean, I used to run um, an, an IT department inside the NHS for Clatteridge Centre for Oncology upon the Wirral. And purchasing was a nightmare trying to talk to companies like Warren, I knew they had a great product, I knew it was even priced brilliantly, but if it wasn't part of the setup, then it was horrendous. And I think um, from what I've seen talking to the Betsy Cadwallader where I'm from, that has slowly improved in Wales, thankfully, and they're allowing these smaller, agile companies to come in and deliver a much better job. I think the NHS itself has to sort of, and it is doing in Wales, thankfully, trust more of its IT and its uh, information officers to talk to companies like Warren and understand at the level that they're talking at that, that there is going to be the correct decision made, that they know what, from a computing point of view, the client, the patient needs and the clinicians want and what companies like Warren is capable to deliver. And the more that trust gets filtered down, the more things, it'll become easier for the companies and you'll actually start seeing things on the ground happen a lot faster which I think is really where we need to go, and I think it's where we are going with Wales. Yeah, I, I, th I think that is, you know, certainly we want to be in that position. I think the, the, the key issue here is, is the whole procurement question, isn't it? Is how do we procure in the public sector? Uh, it's not just health, it's the whole of the public sector, and how do we do that in a way that is helpful to, to smaller companies? Because generally speaking, the rules are such that it makes it either too difficult, i.e. expensive to, to, to uh, enter into procurement process, or it becomes a bar because you don't have particular values or you know, um, guarantees with, with, with the work. So um, I think there's, there are ways around that, but it does take a lot of work to be determined to find ways around it. It doesn't happen by accident, does it? Because if I wanted to go and buy something, then, then by the very nature of doing that, we replace an OJU advert and the whole process becomes cumbersome. Um, so you have to work on, on uh, the cus whichever we are, way we are, the customer side to ma make sure that we are making our procurements as easy for smaller companies to, to engage with. Um, I, I also think that it, there is a challenge for us as well about getting the capacity within uh, the NHS to be able to do that, because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but actually creating that capacity by opening it up to the market is, quite, is, is a challenge and, and will always be difficult, I think. The DVLA seems to have a very good model for being able to procure small, a bit of research, a bit of innovation, and I think that's something the NHS could learn from a lot. The SBRI has been a great opportunity for us through Innovate UK and linking that then in, we'll see how the next six months or so goes into an actual operational business model is going to be critical because it is incredibly difficult. You know, even though, you know, I'm 25 years, the NHS is, and, you know, and academia, and now small business trying to get in. Um, and 
there's also a slight concern, isn't there, about ooh, are, are we allowed to talk to the private sector? So there's, a, there's an awful lot that can be done. But as far as innovation, I think it does need SMEs. It's, you can innovate within the NHS, but it is difficult. Um, and we have the freedom to do that within an SME. I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the P word for procurement. Um, again, from, from a government perspective, there is a, a great deal of support for ICT, for technology development, for digital in general, and this event is an example, um, and for the life sciences and health sector as well, particularly, and events like BioWills um, reflect that. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I suppose I'd open it up a little bit to say that there's more than the NHS as a market for digital healthcare technology. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're working with employers um, and patients or the public themselves, um, families, carers of elderly relatives might well be self-payers in certain circumstances. So um, th there's more than just a procurement route. There's sometimes opening up the platform so that people can develop products which they will sell externally to whoever and monetize them in, in their own way. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm, I'm going to do a bit of visioning now. There's a, there's a quote from um, my good friend Bill Gates. <laughs> Um, and he says, people often, he's not my friend by the way, um, people sometimes say um, that, uh, or people often overestimate what they can achieve in one year and underestimate what they can achieve in 10 years. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to come down, I'm a civil servant, so I'm going to ask you to come down smack bang in the middle and say, what do you think digital in healthcare is going to look like in five years? So that's 2020. Don't limit yourself to Wales. Um, feel free to say it'll be look like this in Wales and it might be like this elsewhere in the world or, or so on, but just a sort of a bit of a speculative future horizon scanning about what you think digital and healthcare is going to look like five years from now. And nobody wants to go first on that one. <laughs> so happy to go first because we spend a lot of time thinking about what this is because we have venture capital investment and looks at that kind of return. So. Um, a lot of the current healthcare market is, or digital healthcare is built on this data collection and data is only as useful as the insights it creates. So if you know how to use analytics, then most of your job when you use analytics is digging through it to try and find out what the meaning is behind those numbers. So I think what we're going to see more and more is um, intelligent insights created from this cloud of data. What I'm hoping that means is that we're going to have to see integrations. So the idea that data pipe, pipes of data will be connected together and people will increasingly make more specific use case information. So if you're a diabetic over 60 living in a rural area, there will be an app for you or whatever that looks like on the, on the platform. Um, but it'll all be built on some kind of shared infrastructure because what we have at the minute is a land grab going on where people are trying to own the creation of your data through platforms. So you've got Google, Apple, Fitbit, Jawbone, all those big guys out there slugging it out with their venture capital money and their, 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 their pots of money to try and be the people who create the information because the information is the platform. And then when you build things on top, you try and build that second layer of, of technology. So what I hope we see is not more data. What I hope we see is more efficient insights and insights that use retrospective data and incremental discrete data collection to build confidence in those insights so that somebody can walk into a, a, a GP and say, look, I got an alert that said... I've been sedentary for a while, I've been less socially connected, I'm using lots of negative language on my social media profile, and my apps told me I may be a little bit sadder than normal, what can I do? Thank you. Um, I hope that we're going to have intelligent insights. The reason I'm working for We Predict is because I sit there as a GP with this vast amount of data, and I want that to be influencing decision makers. So I also have sat sit on now boards, one Welsh Government board where we deal with 160 million. Nobody can tell it. They're only just telling us who it's being spent on. This is in health, this is in housing. Um, they can't tell us which bits are working. I know that with that data, we can predict who they should be spending it on, if they spend it slightly differently, what those outcomes would be. And also, as I've said, um, we can then monitor any new intervention. So in five years, I want to be at that point where people sitting on boards can say, OK, if we do spend 100 grand on, um, I hope we don't still have to be spending it on weight management, but we will realistically, or decreasing smoking, then this is the money that we will save in five or 10 years' time and not just have their annual budget. They, they can't afford to do it because it's too expensive 
expensive. No, this benefits society, this benefits us all. Um, and that's where I want to be in five years' time. And as for people coming to the GP with their data, I don't want any more people coming to my GP surgery, thank you very much, but I want the right people coming in. So not just that it tells them they've been sedentary or something else, but that is feeding alerts into my system. So I don't want all this data feed or... You know, I want sensible insights into exactly the consequences of that. Um, and we can do that now, but I want that to be the norm in five years' time. Um, well, I think it's bad news, because I think we are going to get more data. <laughs> Um, and I think the data is going to come from lots of different sources. And I think we have the big challenge will be how do we filter that out and navigate our way around it. Um, I, I think it's an enormously exciting time in, in um, digital or informatics within the NHS. Um, I think that we will have um, the electronic record available wherever anybody uh, turns up, which I think in itself, just as a, as a thing, is hugely beneficial. Um, because we know there's so many circumstances now where that doesn't happen and, and care isn't as safe as it could be. Um, I, I also think that there will be an opening up of the whole information governance side. Um, I think we'll, we'll very quickly get into a, a phase where the secondary care data and the primary care data are available to the other sectors because it may surprise a lot of people that if you go into secondary care, your GP data isn't available to them routinely and vice versa. But I think that, uh, that barrier will be broken down within the next uh, five years, if not hopefully very soon. Um, so I think we will see an opening up of data available about you clinically, um, and I think we'll see an explosion of other types of data as well, including the sort of uh, predictive data, um, text data, your computer telling you you're unwell and should, really should go and see that lovely GP um, that's got plenty of time to see you. Um, I think we'll see all of that happening. The, the difficulty will be how do we then put new <laughs> systems in place to manage that such that we're not just creating demand um, because one of the challenges for the NHS is that, as you were mentioning earlier on, you, it's, we have spe you know, spe sped up, speeded up, whatever the word is, um, made things happen more quickly. Um, and, but when you do that, what you do is you allow more people to come in, and actually healthcare gets more and more expensive because you're able to do the, you're just creating capacity for the expensive things to be done. Is that enough? Um, from uh, my point of view, not being a pessimist, I think we'll have the electronic patient record. I think beyond that, we'll be pretty much the same as we are today. Um, not because we're slow or anything like that, but I think we're cautious. And I think we should be cautious, because at the end of the day, it's your data that we're dealing with. And we need to know exactly where that is. You have the right to know where that is. One of the things I'd like to see less data orientated is the informatics profession recognized as a profession, so that people leaving college, leaving university, make a choice about joining informatics and understanding the career progression and, and those types of things. And I think if we can achieve some of that in the next five years and get informatics to be a profession and in Wales have the electronic patient record, we've got a huge stable platform then to go further. Um, like Andrew as well, I'm, I, I think there is going to be more data generated and I, I put my hand up to confess I'm one of those people who wants to generate more data. But I want to generate more data at the coalface. I want to generate data for if you are a diabetic, then why can't your toilet be contacting your GP and telling it what's going on with your urine? I don't have a, an issue with that because it should send the alarm bells if there's a problem. If there's no problem, the GP doesn't need to know. I want the home to look after people who have uh, you've had a stroke. So if you're one of those people like me who sits there watching the rugby and his blood pressure goes up and, you know, his heart rate goes up to 162 because my children have put a monitor on me when I've watched them, uh, then you probably need to be told to leave the room or calm down or do something. So if we can be more preven preventative by gathering the data and watching what's going on and feeding the relevant things into the GP systems through systems that Warren designs and all those types of things, that's going to take longer than five years. Um, I think that's, we're probably looking at the next sort of 15, 20 years, where we get to the point of where we're generating lots of data, but it's now being used very sensibly, very cautiously, but at the same time giving information to GPs that's needed when it's needed. Grand. I was expecting a more exciting science fiction-y uh, kind of vision. Well, you know, I, well, I, actually, I think for most people, it's going to be pretty much the same. I think we overestimate the pace of change. Most people, it will be the same. I think there will be a big group of early adopters 
that we'll be doing things very differently. Uh, data, I think, is going to shift. There's, there, there's, a, there's a saying that um, if you're not paying for the service, then you're not the customer, you're the product. Um, and that's certainly what some of these big data companies are doing at the minute, Google, Microsoft, and others. They're sucking up data. And actually, they've got tools that they're not flexing yet. The Data Protection Act gives us as individuals the right to require the release of information on us. Um, and if Microsoft was to make that easy, then more and more people would be sucking data out. And the reason they'll do that is because companies like Microsoft and Apple and Google will do something with that information and present it back in whizzy, colorful charts and actionable information to them. That's going to change. Um, and I think spot testing of things like blood pressure and other things is going to change to, to sort of wearable sensors. The doctor will give you something to wear for a week and you'll come back and it'll give you a pattern. I think that will change. But most, most things will stay largely the same, I think, unfortunately. One thing I think will happen is around Proteus, be it Proteus or a different company. For those of you who are not familiar with this, this is a, um, you take your medication and it's embedded within your medication um, and they've now rolled it out to a, a range of different medications and it's still in trial, but it, it works. And you, you get your um, physical activity data and your heart data, um, your BP data, everything from taking your medication. So you not only, the data not only tells you if you're taking medication, but how it's relating to your vital statistic. You know, right. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not those ones. Um, and that is fast. And actually, Proteus, they are becoming a data company. So although they have this great innovation, this great bit of kit, they want that data. So, yeah. So I'm going to throw, um, we've, we've got five plus minutes left, just about, if we squeeze it. So are there any questions from the floor? I don't know if we've got another microphone, or I'll come out and wonder and hand, hand it over to you. Any questions? Uh, hello, I'm uh, Janet Waitman. I'm here from an Iron Bevan University Health Board. Um, <laughs> NHS, as you say, enormous organisation, and how can we become more agile? I was therefore very interested, uh, Warren, that you seem to have got uh, a proposal as to how we might actually um, work together to make things a lot um, swifter, because you know, we want the pace of change to increase and increase in the right direction. So without giving any of your company secrets away, are you able to give us any clues as to how um, companies such as yours and the NHS or indeed other large corporates might be able to capitalize on, on this proposed model of, um, should we say, incremental uh, selling, buying, whichever side you're on, <laughs> please. Yeah, so, uh I think we, we, we're trying to hack it at the minute with, so it's key for us to find someone within the organization who is open to this change happening. That's like fundamental to us. The more senior that person, the better. And then the way we work is we propose a short pilot, which is usually under a discretionary budget, so it's easy to fit into those kind of models where we can trial something, it can go wrong. But we are always super crystal clear about the fact that whatever we're promising to deliver, we want the ability to come back on a monthly or quarterly basis and look at those numbers and say we think there's a better number to measure now so that we can change that project plan so that we're not locked into this waterfall. So we propose a waterfall model, but we, un we, we get the buy-in from the fact that that's going to change, which inherently makes it more agile. So it's kind of a mix between the two. And um, we're finding that that's actually going down relatively well, and we're finding the honesty of going in and saying, look, we are going to be wrong, um, supports the idea that we're an ethical business to do business with. Like, w w I, I think um, some of the systems that are set up in the way that companies sell to the NHS almost makes it like crystal maze. So you make it through a series of trials and at the end you get put in a dome where you grab as much money as you can and run off. And that's not what we want. What we want is small, agile, incremental buys that allow you to change. And we understand if what we do is not valuable or not effective and, uh, and not working, that we're going to change it as a business because we want it to fundamentally work. And as long as a buyer understands that that's how we, how we think, then uh, that's a big part to the buy-in. It, but it comes down to people do business with people, so we need to find that person who's able to make a decision to be more agile, uh, which is why I said, like, you know, people process vision. That's the, find the person, show them your process, paint the vision, work through it. Does anyone else? Want uh, do you have any examples?
I was just wondering if there were any examples that of you working with the NHS where that's actually part way through a successful journey at the moment. So we've just agreed a pilot with ABMU um, and we are talking to AB as well. So Anir and Bevan have a proposal which is similar but more we're looking at workforce health. Um, we also have Cardiff and Vale have two projects that are looking at which they're happy to do that model on. So we've been talking to senior people within all those three health boards as well as talking to Public Health Wales who seem it's similarly open. Once one person goes and understands that there's a confidence there, once we convince people we're not some big corporate trying to suck money out of the NHS and leave patients in a worse condition, it, it, that's never our, our, our goal. We, we care about our users. Uh, Matthew Lloyd from Digital Communities Wales. Um, I do think that uh, the, uh, the panel mentioned about the older uh, generation possibly benefiting most from technology. And there's just a point more than probably a question where we've got uh, 75, over 75, there's only 25% of those people can actually use the technology we're probably talking about. Um, and I just think that maybe now is a good time, especially when you're talking about the five-year plan, to think about investing to save in those type of things. So investing in the whole, in, in the digital health at home might be a good thing to start considering now. Um, and again, maybe a pilot with, with ourselves or, or with uh, uh, Welsh Government projects, but maybe we can have a look at something uh, to pilot you know, that health at home um, agenda. But I think it's important to think about the people that actually need it most, maybe are the are the furthest away from actually being digitally literate or digitally included. It's, yeah, it's, it is the irony that some of the hardest to reach people are the CDEs, the, the older population and lower low income. It's, it's definitely a challenge. It's something we try and tackle by being pretty technology agnostic. So we work via SMS, email, web, like the lowest barriers for technology we can. And we'd be really interested in, like, if you want to talk, please come grab me. I think... Last question. <laughs> if we take a last question here, please. Um, just building on what was just said, we need a better way to network, because I'm sitting here representing answers to that question, linking up with people on the stage. In other words, you know, we're asking lots of questions, but actually maybe there are a lot more people here. But one of the things nobody suggested is a better network within Wales... So there's Public Health Network Wales, which Linking launched, us all together. which recently launched. They have a website which is uh, going to be a content funnel. I, I think it's early days. Um, I'm not sure exactly on the agenda, but it's something we've started engaging with to try and make ourselves more visible to public health because it is tough when you're a company of seven dealing with a company of seventy thousand or an organisation of seventy thousand. Being made, being known is 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 a challenge. But I think you just got to pick pick your pick your network entry points really brutally really try and go in as senior as possible and help them filter you filter you down yeah just on on top of that as well there are obviously on the informatics side things like that there's uk chip there's obviously bcs on bcs health wales those organizations talk to them they'll help you find the inroads in as well because obviously we've got members who are in the nhs informatics service so we can all try and help you match up with things like that so <laughs> no, yeah, so if you, if you try things like, actually, BCS, UK chip, all of those types. I think it's fair to say as well that this is what this event is about. Please network, take some time to talk to people and uh, hopefully further everyone's um, benefits of this session. So thank you very much, Ethan. Well done. Nigel, uh, Warren, Andrew, and of course, Kerry. Thank you so much for uh, contributing to this session.